Uh, so, welcome to uh, our first installment of the speaker series. Uh, I am delighted to have Aaron Major from uh, the Univ State University of New York at Albany. Uh, Aaron is in the Department of uh, Sociology at SUNY uh, and uh, went there from his, basically his PhD uh, at uh, New York University, which he finished in 2008. Nice. Yes, thank you. Yes. Um, I first encountered Eric uh, when Eric, sorry, uh, Aaron when he was uh, part of um, uh, he he was part of a special issue in the journal Ripe on kind of uh, interesting developments in the international politics of banking and regulation, and he wrote a kind of a very interesting paper on neoliberalism. Uh, and uh, so uh, here he is, going to going to talk about uh, Bretton Woods, and this talk is effectively based upon his uh, forthcoming book uh, of a similar name. Uh, which he will uh, tell us in a second. That's going to be coming out uh, with Stanford University Press uh, in uh, a few spring. short months in the spring. Yeah. So he's going to talk for 30 to 40 minutes, and then we get to grill him mercilessly like we normally do. Aaron, take All it right. away. Um, well, thanks for having me. Thanks, Ron. I appreciate this. It's uh, nice to come and talk with you, and this is really a, a good chance for me. Um, I was telling Randall earlier, I've sort of been immersed in just trying to wrap up the book and get it all to done and to now try to sort of step back and try to really distill what I really want to convey as the core argument of the project. Um, and so, uh, as you, uh, Randall was saying, the um, uh, book that's coming out in the spring, and the, the title of that is going to be Architects of Austerity. Um, and so the talk I'm going to give is really based on that book. And in, in the book, I begin with a question that I'll, that I'll start with today. And, and that is the question of why has the, the politics of austerity, and particularly need the neoliberal economic policy paradigm, been so resilient in the face of crisis? And uh, this question came to me because as I sort of was doing the research and involved in the project and looking back over the last 100 years or so of Western political economy, in previous moments of crisis, existing policy paradigms have tended to fare quite poorly in the wake of crisis and give way to new modes of economic thinking. So classical liberalism gives way to Keynesianism in the wake of the global Great Depression in the 1930s. And then Keynesianism gives way to neoliberalism and monetarism in the wake of the global profitability crisis of the 1970s. Now, to the degree that this actually constitutes a pattern, uh, recent experience is a break from this pattern. Uh, since the crisis of 2008, while there have been sort of some attempts to try to situate the crisis with that as a crisis of neoliberalism, that really hasn't taken hold. And really what we've seen is a continuation of a basic neoliberal policy paradigm um, under the auspices of an uh, austere approach to uh, economic recovery uh, from the crisis. <coughs> Um, so, so this really is uh, the, the question, right? Why this resiliency of austerity? And so this is the question that I'm going to try to supply an answer for uh, for us today. Now, before I get into the, the answer I want to get into, let me uh, say a couple things about what I think the answer is not or not completely about. Um, I, I don't think that the answer, or at least the heart of the answer, has to do with the nature of the structure of neoliberalism's ideas or its ideological core, as some who work more, say, from a social constructivist standpoint may have argued. Um, now, of course, political and economic issues, they need to be framed, they need to be articulated, they need some kind of ideological content. And austerity, uh, Mark Blythe has recently written about this in his new book, uh, it, it's couched within a particularly, uh, or sorry, in a sort of a specific um, set of ideas about the causes of market failure and specifically that markets fail when business confidence is low and that business confidence is low when governments overspend and when profit to wage ratios are also too low. And so then the solution is to balance budgets and keep consumer spending and wages um, at a sort of a relatively low proportion relative to profits. Uh, so while the politics of austerity are clearly drawn from this interlocking set of ideas about the nature of markets in capitalist society, I don't think that it's the ideas themselves um, that are driving this resiliency of austerity. And so I think it'd be a mistake to reduce the diffusion 
uh, of austerity, to the power of these ideas. And, you know, after all, these ideas have been with us for quite some time. We see them in the classical liberal period of the, um, of the gold standard era, and then we see them still there, and I'm going to talk about this a bit more, through the post-war era, but in, in a sort of a more subsumed state, and then they've come back. Okay? So if we want to understand not just the resilience of austerity, but also its variation over time, why it's been prominent in some periods and less so in others, um, then I think we need to situate the ideological components of austerity, any economic paradigm in its political context. Uh, austerity, after all, like any other economic agenda, is tied to a set of interests. Um, and in the case of austerity, of course, calls for austerity will come from different places at various times over history, but a consistent sort of constituency uh, has really been the, um, the organizations around finance, both private finance but also public finances, central banks and state treasury ministries and, and so forth. Uh, for finance, um, austerity really promises not just capital accumulation, but really more precisely a stable path of capital accumulation. That's why austerity is so attractive from somebody, for, for a standpoint of financial interests. Um, bus, economic busts are clearly a problem, but so too are excessive economic booms, which can erode asset values through price inflation. And so for those who have their economic fortunes tied up in financial assets, economic stability is really something that you're um, keen to achieve. So what I want to suggest here in this talk is that, in the perspective I'm going to work from, is that the, the, the question of austerity is about something deeper than the history of a set of ideas. It's really about the history of the, the rise and then the fall and then the reemergence of finance. And so why austerity? Um, so my answer to this question is that it's really that the institutionalization of austerity, but in which I mean the creation of a relatively stable set of conditions that increase the influence of finance over the economic policy making process. It was really an outgrowth of the Bretton Woods uh, international monetary system. And really more specifically, it's an outgrowth out of a set of efforts to preserve that system uh, in the face of an increasingly liberalized, tumultuous global economic economy that began to emerge in the early 1960s. Now, uh, of course, I'm not the first to argue that this sort of liberalization of capital in the early 60s is put... Um, but the Bretton Woods system under stress. And others, others have made this argument. Um, wh what I want to do is tweak this argument a little bit in a way that I think is significant. What I want to argue is that the globalization of financial markets was important in this process, but in and of itself was not the thing um, that helped to institutionalize austerity. Rather, it was the response to the weakness of the Bretton Woods systems, the way in which uh, particularly... Um, monetary authorities came together to try to shore up that system throughout the 1960s that put in place a particular kind of institutional architecture that then laid the foundation for the, for the resiliency of austerity in decades to come. Okay, so it wasn't global markets itself, in and of themselves, that forced a race to the bottom and a wholesale adoption of neoliberalism. Whether the globalization of capital markets did in the early 1960s is it weakened the existing mechanisms of balance of payments adjustment, or at least made them less effective, created a need for new mechanisms to provide balance of payments financing for countries which increasingly needed it because their accounts were in much more flux due to inflows and outflows of short-term capital. And so it was into this gap, into this institutional gap, that state monetary authorities stepped in, and particularly central banks, and central banks of the uh, United States and Western Europe. And so what happens as a result is that <coughs> governments seeking short-term balance of payments financing in the 1960s increasingly have to turn to the monetary authorities for assistance. So they now become dependent upon the cooperation and thus the confidence of private but also public financial agencies, 
Right? And it's these new relations of dependency that provide the mechanism that gives monetary authorities, domestic and foreign, uh, a much greater capacity to exert influence over national economic agendas. So the policy agenda of international finance and agenda of austerity um, is selected into the policy making process, not because the ideas themselves are so powerful or there's something about the ideas that make them so salient, but through this uh, redistribution of international monetary power. So th that's the essential argument that I'm going to lay out today and then draw connections to what these process, how these processes unfold in the 60s and how they connect us to where we are um, in the current moment. So the rest of the time, I'm going to do this in uh, three steps. Uh, first, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the nature of Bretton Woods and the structures of post-war embedded liberalism. And then second, I'm going to look at the precise ways in which these mechanisms worked in the 1960s. I'm going to look at a case... You know, the, the, the British case of economic policy making during the Labour government from 1964 to 1968 and discuss how that we can understand that case through this um, framework that I just set up. And then I will talk about how these institutional innovations that were put in place in the 1960s laid a foundation for the continuing sort of saliency and resiliency of austerity into the present. Okay. That's where we're going. Who Bretton Woods? Um, so th this semester I, I get to teach a, a fun class for my graduate students that I like. It's a class called World Capitalism. It's always fun to do that with them. And in that class, uh, in fact, just a couple weeks ago, we were reading Robert Cox's Production Power and World Order. Particularly, there's a chapter on, I think it's called Pax Americana, but it's about the U.S. in, in the post-war period. And it was interesting. I mean, I've read that before, and but I must not have just touched it while I was sort of wrapping up the book. I hadn't thought about it in a while. And when I was thinking about it, again, in class, it, you know, it's striking reading um, Cox's description of the post-war settlements. And see, in Cox's argument, or at least his account, is that when the, the governments had sat down to negotiate Bet and Bretton Woods, he characterizes them as neoliberal states, right? Governments that were more interested <coughs> in opening up the world economy after World War II. Okay. So in Cox's interpretation, Bretton Woods sort of privileges international economic integration over national autonomy. In his account, the triumph of Bretton Woods is that it sort of halts the turn to regionalism and autarky that had developed in the interwar period and brings back an integrated global economy. Now, it's probably not going to come it may already be obvious why this is a somewhat striking account for people in this room because it's exactly at odds with what I think is a sort of the prevailing account of the post-war settlements, and that would be um, John Ruggie's account of embedded liberalism. In Ruggie's account, the era of embedded liberalism, we have states who are more concerned about protecting national economic autonomy from the forces of the global economy. And the triumph of Bretton Woods is that it breaks the back of international finance, who for years in their single-minded pursuit of international monetary stability had sort of sacrificed national economic autonomy. And so the, the Bretton Woods settlement is then a, a victory for the embedded liberals because it shields national governments from the forces of economic globalization while simultaneously fostering conditions for a more manageable kind of global economic integration. So two stories here about Bretton Woods, which one of them is right? Uh, th this question has drawn a lot of attention time and time again because the answer to it has important implications for how we think about where we are today and how we understand the present moment. If the Bretton Woods era is Robert Cox's Bretton Woods era, then contemporary neoliberalism is just a continuation of neoliberalism that was put in place in the 1940s and 1950s. It's a continuation of very well-established patterns. If it's Ruggie's Bretton Woods, then the present moment is a decisive break with the past, a significant new era in international political economy. Now, rather than try to lend support to one side of the argument or the other, <coughs> Uh, the strategy I've taken is to try to move past this debate by recognizing that 
Uh, Bretton Woods was not simply one or the other, but rather that it was a system characterized by an underlying tension between Cox's neoliberalism and Ruggie's embedded liberalism, between those who wanted to reestablish and strengthen the circuits of global capitalism that had been cut by 30 years of World War and Depression, and those who wanted to protect the national growth experiments of governments who were trying to rebuild after the devastation of World War II. Uh, moreover, while there were specific agreements that were reached at Bretton Woods in 1944, there was really nothing settled about the Bretton Woods era, even though we use this term, the Bretton Woods settlement or the post-war settlement. Uh, the Bretton Woods era was really shaped by this deep-seated tension between its neoliberal and its embedded liberal elements. In my own research, um, I've, I've spent a lot of time at the, um, the archives of the OECD, and I looked at the OECD as a site where these conflicts and tensions over the nature of the post-war order manifested. And, um, you know, the book I go into is a lot more, but um, yeah, there's the OECD, at least the old part of it, and then a bunch of glass stuff now for the new part. Okay. And in the OECD in the early 1960s, we can get a sense of how these tensions appeared by looking at how an organization like the OECD understood its own mission and how it articulated it in its own policy statements. So on the one hand, uh, one of the first things that the OECD does when it's officially formed in 1961 is the Ministerial Council puts forth a growth mandate, a 50% growth mandate for 1970. So that by 1970, the average growth, the, the average GDP of the entire OECD area should be 50% higher than it was. So it's like 5% a year. That's an ambitious growth target, right? That's a real commitment to growth. On the other hand, um, as uh, Rawi uh, Abdullah has documented in his study of capital liberalization in this period, the OECD is also hard at work uh, writing this code of capital liberalization that is trying to relax or dismantle significant parts of the capital controls that were put in place at Bretton Woods. Okay. So at the OECD, we can see both of these projects going on simultaneously. One project of pursuing economic growth and one project about uh, liberalizing capital. Now, of course, the official policy statements give the sense that both of these things are possible, that we could have our cake and eat it too. Uh, but, but in, of course, in the day-to-day -day practice of this, it really turned into a lot of not overly aggressive, but certainly explicit conflict between these competing policy goals. What is going to take pride of place? Are we going to privilege growth, even if it means we have to have some instability in the global economy? or slow down the liberalization of capital, or are we going to emphasize building a new global economic order, even if it means um, to do that, governments have to sacrifice some of their ambitions about growth. Okay, so which one of these wins? Now, the, the, the short answer is that it depends. Um, and uh, my, the argument that I try to hammer at over and over again in the book is that it what it really starts to depend on is the position of finance in the international monetary system. Okay. What the code of capital liberalization does, and, and not just the code, but the actual efforts to liberalize capital, is it starts to put the Bretton Woods system under pressure, and in doing so, starts to undermine the growth agenda. Okay. So, so again, as I said, you know, I'm not the first person to suggest that the emergence of capital liberalization posed problems for Bretton Woods. Right? In the late 50s, the U.S. has massive drains on its gold supply, threatening the entire integrity of the international monetary system. But even countries that were seeing capital inflows in this period weren't all that happy. The, the Germans, who were trying to keep a very tight control over monetary policy, were not happy that their capital markets were flooded with U.S. dollars or other currencies. Um, so for, for countries, whether they were seeing inflows or outflows, this was a problem, but at the same time, nobody was really willing to go back to a time when they would just control capital. So what emerges out of this tension, right, this trying to manage the process of capital liberalization, is really a decade of institutional innovation 
to supply new mechanisms of balance of payments financing for countries whose accounts are increasingly subjected to tumultuous inflows and outflows. Now the IMF is there, of course, that's supposed to be doing some of this, but the resources of the IMF are not up to the task. Right? There just isn't enough money at the IMF to handle the scope of the financial inflows and outflows that are coming about through the emergence of short-term capital flows. Even if you know now, in comparative standpoint, they seem quite small, at the time they were quite significant. So it wasn't the capital flows themselves that weakened the commitment to the growth agenda. And not just the OECD's growth agenda, but really started to pose constraints for governments who are pursuing growth agendas. But what it was was the particular response to the cap process of capital liberalization and the way in which that response brought finance which had been kind of subsumed in the Bretton Woods period through the 1940s, 1950s, back to the center of the international monetary system. So in the early 1960s, we start to see new credit mechanisms emerge to try to bolster the Bretton Woods system. We get, for example, the general, agree, uh, general arrangements to borrow, which is essentially, you know, at first it just, it's a way for get governments to commit more money to the IMF to try to strengthen its resources so that it can give more money to countries with facing balance of payments deficits. Uh, we get the London gold pool, so countries commit various parts of their gold supply to the London gold market to try to stave off speculation there and preserve this sort of gold-based system. And then we get this elaborate network of currency swap arrangements that emerge, where central banks just sort of open accounts in each other's currencies, but in other banks, so that if you know, if you suddenly need some Deutschmarks or some Swiss francs or whatever you need, you've got a line of credit open from the other central bank. So again, you can sort of meet these short-term demands for financing. And again, mostly to hold off uh, speculation against currencies. Now, one consequence of all these things was that it did give governments, particularly central banks, new weapons to combat speculation and try to preserve some stability in the international monetary system. But more significantly, all three of these things, the general arrangements to borrow, the London gold pool, the swap arrangements, they're all either agreements between central banks or they were dependent upon cooperation from central banks. All right, so the, sorry. Sorry, 1960s, early 1960s. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and really, 61, 62, 63 is when these things are put in place. Early 1960s. Yeah. And so the... You know, swap arrangements, these are between central banks. The general arrangements to borrow, they're funds to the IMF, but they're not just given unilaterally. You have to get the central bankers to agree to lend the funds to the IMF for these standby borrowing arrangements. Same with the London gold pool. You have to convince central banks to sort of give over parts of their gold supply to the London gold market, right, to the Bank of England, uh, to manage for them. So a consequence then is this elevation of the monetary authorities into the man management of the international monetary system. They effectively become the managers of that system through these new credit arrangements. So if you're a country facing a significant balance of payments deficit, you now need to go to the central banks of Germany, of Switzerland, of the Netherlands, of Italy, of France, of Western Europe and North America and ask for assistance, right? It is no longer something that is just given. It's no longer something that you are just entitled to, say, from the IMF where you have sort of rights to draw from the IMF, but you are asking now for assistance. So you're dependent upon cooperation. In addition, and there's a second effect here, central banks and monetary authorities, which, you know, really, even in World War I and through the post-war period, they're much more sort of encapsulated in their national context, become transnationalized. They've begun to cooperate and collaborate in a variety of international forums. Right? The G10 is born out of the process of managing the general agreements to borrow and managing those transactions. The Banks for International Settlements, which, you know, in the early 1940s, 
it seemed kind of a useless organization, a holdover from paying you know, reparations out of World War I, is suddenly revitalized as a forum for central bankers to meet and discuss issues. And so central banks and treasury officials become more cohesive at the international level. They become to function more of a group and less as individual national officials. So these two trajectories, you get the elevation of central banks and other monetary authorities in the international monetary system, and they become increasingly cohesive and coordinated, functioning more as a group and less as isolated uh, units. Okay. So it's these institutional transformations that strengthen the foundations for a classical economic orthodoxy over and against the cause of embedded liberalism. How did this work in practice? Uh, so in the book I go through several cases, the U.S., the U.K., and Italy. I'll talk about the, the U.K. a bit here because it's, I don't know, people are sick of talking about the U.S. and this one's a little bit more straightforward and kind of fun and sad. Right. Uh, so here the case is 1964. The labor <coughs> government comes back into power after more than a decade of conservative rule under Harold Wilson. So, um, And the, one of the keys to labor's victory in 64 is that Wilson had, uh, really the party, had articulated a a new economic agenda for the country that promised to solve the two most pressing economic problems they were facing. Very low rates of growth at home. <coughs> the British economy had been stagnant through most of the 1950s with very, very low rates of growth. And a persistent balance of payments deficit and just constant attacks against the sterling. So the conservatives had dealt with the economy by basically sacrificing the domestic economy to the cause of preserving sterling through what they was basically called stop-go. Every time the economy would heat up and prices would inflate and sterling would come under attack, they would clamp down on the economy, throw the economy into recession, restore some stability in the balance of payments, and so you have these sort of these stop-go cycles with a net result of basic stagnation. Okay. Uh, Wilson and his team, and here he was uh, relying on the Hungarian economist Thomas Bala, who was a associate of Keynes, or at least you know, spent some time corresponding with him, uh, they believed in a different approach. They believed that both stagnation at home and the balance of payments problem could be solved through a program of aggressive economic growth through modernization. So in 1965, the party puts forward its new national plan, and it calls for an economic growth rate of about 4%. It's nearly a full percentage point higher than the average growth rate of the previous decades. This is an ambitious agenda. And to achieve this, uh, Wilson pushes through new taxes on corporations and on capital gains. And now the, the impetus behind these is twofold. On the one hand, this is still informed by sort of a social democratic principle of redistribution, but it's also uh, informed by this idea that they could modernize industry by using the tax code to compel them to engage in all kinds of new productive techniques. So this is what, what scholars call the kind of a technocratic socialism. And really what it is is a sort of a forward-looking recognition that the country needed, it needed to be rebuilt. They would just need little tweaks around the margin, but really the economic engine needed to be rebuilt. And it, so it was a long-term strategy for putting the British economy back on a growth path. And this program was massively popular among the voters. So in 1966, Labor calls a new election. At less than two years after first coming to power, because their popularity had grown so much, Labor sort of squeaked in in 1964. In 66, they bring in another 800,000 votes, and they shore up a very slim parliamentary majority to 97 seats. So they are now fully in control of the domestic political scene. And this is the first time since 1951 that the number of people voting for labor between elections didn't drop. So this was a historic shift in the domestic political scene. But then this is also where the story gets very puzzling. Because then just three months after this election with a landslide popular victory, uh, the Wilson government puts forward its budget for the following year that contains tough deflationary measures targeted explicitly at workers and consumers. And so by 1968, the party of growth and technocratic socialism had really become the party of austerity. So why this turn of events? And the, and the answer lies in the transformation in these institutions of international monetary management that I discussed earlier. The British voters supported 
Labor's growth agenda, but the international financial community did not. They were actually quite happy with Stop Go. The Stop Go, after all, was really just putting into practice classical liberal doctrine. You structure domestic economic policy around the demands of the balance of payments. Labor's agenda was a break from that orthodoxy. Okay. Now, there was a way in which Labor's plan could have worked. Right? They had a long-term growth strategy, and they did need short-term financing to manage the balance of payments while the growth agenda worked out. The problem, though, is that that system did not look like, say, the kind of system that Keynes himself had imagined in the 1940s. In this alternate universe, the British would have just been given lots and lots of balance of payments financing to tide them over until the domestic agenda could work itself out. Here, short-term financing came from monetary authorities and was not freely given. It had to be asked for over and over and over again. So short-term financing was contingent, and it was contingent upon the willingness of monetary authorities to make these funds available. Now, no one was willing to let sterling collapse, and so financing was going to be forthcoming to some degree, but they were also unwilling to provide the funds without clear strings attached. So, for example, when the Wilson government turns to the IMF for a new standby borrowing <laughs> arrangement under the new general arrangements to borrow, International monetary authorities make it very clear that in exchange, the government needs to scale back its ambitions for domestic economic growth. And in addition, even as the um, labor is turning more to the IMF, which is that gray line there in that graph, and this is its, how much where its official financing comes from. In 1965, you can see it's the peak year for borrowing from the IMF for the, for the British. 1965, though, is also the year when they increasingly tap into these other kinds of credit arrangements, particularly currency swaps. You can see through 65 and 66, and particularly 67, when sterling is really under pressure just before it ends up being devalued. They really use these other credit arrangements to shore up the balance of payments. It's, so it's not the IMF now that is the principal funder of the British uh, balance payments deficits, but it's these other credit mechanisms. Okay, so 1965 is a real turning point in the evolution of this structure. And so throughout this period, labor faces persistent calls to scale back on its domestic growth agenda to deal with the problem of its balance of payments. And moreover, as the borrowing increases, the British are now indebted to other central banks. So the problem of debt makes the problem of the balance of payments more severe because now it's no longer sufficient to just achieve a rough balance in the international accounts. Now you have to achieve a surplus because that's how you're going to convince people to lend you more money if you're going to show them that you can actually pay it back. So this means you have to work even harder to get your international accounts in order. So it's when faced with these pressures that in 1968, uh, Harold Wilson's party put forward what he later described in his memoirs as the most punishing budget in Britain's peacetime history. And of course, it's even worse from the standpoint of labor is that this did nothing to actually preserve sterling. The currency was subsequently devalued, which then made two campaign provinces that labor had to break. And because of this, it would then take decades for labor's political fortunes to recover not even in the form of they were in the 1960s. Okay, so that was then. This is now. How do these two, how does this story of the past of the 1960s connect us back to the present? In return to the question that I started with, why has austerity remained so resilient today? The connection between these two periods is that institutional architecture that was built up as part of the effort to shore up the Bretton Woods system and really this transnationalization of monetary authority that evolved from that process. As I mentioned, old organizations like the Bank for International Settlements became revitalized, new meeting grounds like the Group of Ten were formed, and these really became the, the, the launch points of efforts to rebuild a new international monetary system in the wake of Bretton Woods. Now, as been in the case in the 1940s, the collapse of Bretton Woods raised new problems about how to manage the international monetary system. 
currency values were in flux, capital was flowing freely, um, and in a much more tumultuous global environment, you know, it was great if you were a currency speculator or if you were great at arbitraging interest rate differentials, but for national governments, it was terrible. I mean, banking crises, financial crises, current currency crises. So something needed to be done. But we certainly were not going to go back to an old Bretton Woods system. Capital controls were off the table. Other kinds of, these kinds of strong regulatory efforts were really off the table. So in this effort to rebuild some new kind of international monetary system, the interests that were in the best position to launch that effort were those that had been sort of elevated to the heights of the international monetary system in the 1960s through the process of shoring up Bretton Woods. So it was through the Bank for International Settlements, through the G10, through these other forums that this process really unfolded. Okay. So we get a similar process that we had at Bretton Woods, figuring out how to manage the international monetary system, but without the competing social forces that would create that tension between the neoliberal and the embedded liberal elements. The elements that were really at the head of that process were really fully entrenched within a sort of a classical economic liberal kind of orthodoxy. So like Bretton Woods, um, and other efforts to deal with international monetary issues, the work really focused around trying to deal with three major problems. Uh, exchange rate volatility, transnational capital movements, and then the need for some way to provide lender of last resort financing for countries facing some kind of deficit or debt crisis. And again, in the case of Bretton Woods, those negotiations reflected a compromise and a tenuous compromise between embedded liberal and neoliberal ideologies in the post Bretton Woods era, really only one side of that equation has remained intact. Okay. Oh, this one burst. Okay. So, oh, I can use the pointer thing. Maybe not. Yeah. No. Okay. Doesn't shine on the screen. So, exchange rate volatility um, as the first problem to deal with. So, how have this sort of these new efforts to deal with exchange rate volatility emerged in this new kind of institutional context? So at the top there, um, we see this through the diffusion of what is inflation targeting practices among central banks. And so by this, this is where central banks set explicit targets for an inflation rate and then use that as a guide for monetary policy. Now, on the one hand, this is a domestic transformation, but it's one that's gone global. A bank for Bank of England study found in 1990 there were maybe Four central banks that did this by 2000, it was up to 50 around the world. So this is really a global diffusion of central bank practice. In addition to being a domestic policy, at the time when this was being discussed, it was really explicitly discussed in terms of its global implications. The idea was that if you could get global domestic prices stable, then that would translate into global currency price stability, right? So that would deal with the problem of exchange rate volatility through domestic price stability. So this is, again, a sort of a very classically liberal way of approaching the problem of international monetary stability. You stabilize the international through domestic functions, orienting the domestic economy to the need of the international. The other consequence of inflation targeting is that as part of putting these regimes and these practices in place, that it's further strengthened the role of central banks and other monetary authorities in the management of the economy. Central bank autonomy is way up, and that's often a direct consequence of the inflation targeting practice. Capital regulation, in the Bretton Woods era, this was done just through capital controls, just you cannot you know, have some kinds of transnational capital transactions. In the post Bretton Woods era, the process of capital uh, <coughs> managing transnational capital movements moved to a capital regulation framework. Here, the global market for capital is just taken as given. Right? Capital is going to flow, and then the only question is, how do you manage that risk? And so this is where the negotiations at the Bank for International Settlements around the Basel Capital Accords. Now, simply what the accords do is sort of specify 
through a variety of factors, just minimum amounts of reserve capital that banks have to hold against their assets and their liabilities. So that the idea is that, you know, capital is going to circulate, things are going to go bad, but at least if things go bad, you've got something in reserve to, as a kind of a stopgap. Now again, um, like with inflation targeting, you can see sort of classical liberal ideas manifesting in the idea of capital regulation, you know, moving past the particulars and the details of how these things work out. In the capital regulation framework, international stability functions through domestic adjustment. Right? It's about domestic economies making changes to their practices to make them compatible with a stable economic environment. In addition, and this is something that Tony Porter has pointed out, um, and I'm sure among others, is that it also shifts capital regulation away from the state and towards the private banks themselves. The Basel Committee sort of makes rules, and then banks are put in charge of figuring out how to carry out those rules. And in further iterations of the Basel Accords, there's a one, and then a two, and a three, and then I think they're working on a four. But through that process, one of the things that's happened is there's this further devolution of regulatory authority down to the private financial sector itself. And then finally, uh, perhaps, you know, despite these efforts, or maybe because of these efforts, financial crises have nevertheless been a, oh, no, you go backwards, a, a sort of a recurring problem in the post-Bretton Woods era. And so the need for lender of last resort functions uh, has been substantial. Now again in Bretton Woods this was supposed to be performed by the IMF um, and then later as I talked about that got supplemented with other functions. Okay. In the post Bretton Woods era lender of last resort functions have been carried out by uh, Eric Hollander called this a, a, B, a Bank for International Sentiments centered regime that's really based on central bank and private bank collaboration where central banks working in cooperation with private financial institutions work together to come up with the money to then support various governments that are in crisis. And we can see this um, in the uh, particularly in the European the resolution and the bailouts for the uh, financial crisis in Europe after 2008. So in 2010, um, or, or, we get uh, in Europe the, the, the creation uh, by the Council of Europe, uh, this thing, the, the uh, European Financial Stability Facility. And this is basically where the financing for the bailouts gets arranged. So, for example, if you were to look at the, where the financing comes from the bailouts for, say, Ireland, maybe a quarter of it comes from the IMF. Some portion of it comes from the Irish government itself, which it gets by you know, cutting down the size of its government and its budget. But then a large portion of it comes from this facility. And its, its name has changed. It's now the ESM, the European Stability Mechanism. Okay. Now, the way they get their money is they issue AAA-rated bonds out into global capital markets, and then private investors invest in those bonds, and then the money goes to the government that needs to bail out, but with the idea that the investors are going to get it paid back, and they're going to get it paid back. I think they guarantee a rate of return of 1% better than whatever some prevailing global interest rate is. Okay. So... Now you can see these similar mechanisms that we saw where the British were dependent upon outside financing for uh, balance of payments assistance being not just reproduced but really strengthened and strengthened with respect to that connection between private and public finance. Indeed, this is a decisive break. This is where we see a decisive break from any of the sort of the embedded liberal notions of the Bretton Woods era. Uh, rather than being shielded from the demands of global capital markets and dealing with domestic problems, <coughs> governments are now sort of fully invested in what private capital markets expect from them because this is where the money is coming from. Okay, so these lines of dependency have only been strengthened. In fact, in many ways, there are, are parallels to the classical gold standard era but with some obvious exceptions, one being 
there's no gold, that's the anchor of this system, although gold markets you know, probably matter to some degree. But more subtly, uh, the other thing that's changed since that era is not only do we see the sort of resurgence of finance and um, the banking sector at the heights of the international monetary system, but this is a much more cohesive and integrated system. Again, this is where private and public finance are cooperating and collaborating much more closely together, and not just individual central banks with particular private banks, but through a much more integrated networks where central banks as a whole have come together, have adopted similar sets of practices and techniques, have a variety of forums to discuss and analyze and collaborate on problems, and again, working with clusters of private banking institutions to deal with national economic problems. Okay, some final, quickly some final thoughts. I've gone way over, I think. So, uh, era of neoliberalism, as others have pointed out, is the era of finance resurgent. And one of the points that I wanted to stress in this talk is that it's not just finance resurgent in the sense that global capital markets are unleashed. It's not just finance resurgent in the sense that the economy has become financialized, as some have used that term, but also in the sense that the new international financial architecture strengthens the influence of public and private finance in the management of the international monetary system. Interests which tend to emphasize stability over growth, balanced budgets over full employment. Um, and, you know, I, I, maybe, maybe a good, I'll skip that to the right of time. I'm going over time. I think a good place to conclude is to go back to Keynes. Okay. Uh, one of those is that off-quoted, I'm not going to remember now where exactly the quote comes from, which is text of Keynes about, you know, witnessing the era of the euthanasia of the rentiers, right? That Keynes sort of felt that he was seeing the time when finance's grip over the global economy was coming to an end. Uh, clearly, he had misread these tea leaves. Uh, the rentiers may have been sort of on the ropes in the 1940s, um, but they were rejuvenated in the 1960s, and through that process of rejuvenation, now occupy the heights of the new international financial architecture. But, but, the, but the insight, right, the real insight I think that Keynes had was that he clearly understood that a global capitalism freed from that barbarous logic of the classical gold standard orthodoxy, it really required more than just changing hearts and minds, changing how we think about the economy. It really required robust international institutions to keep the forces of austerity in check. So for those, you know, who are, say, concerned about the spread and resilience of austerity, the story that I laid out in some ways seems rather bleak, because now I've told you that not only are the ideas powerful, but so are the institutions supporting it. But I think that the history also uh, suggest another thing, which is that these developments are highly variable, and they're also highly dependent on the structure of institutions that we, in fact, put in place. So, that's it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks.